Do you have a special interest in music? Or just tired of dealing with drunk drivers? Then stay tuned as this week we bring you the benefits of music to the general learning process mixed with a little bit of law and history. This is Guyana 411. I am this week's host, Shivani Rampasad. Stay tuned. familiar with Shakespeare's, if music be the food of love, play on. But how many of us have considered music as food for the brain? Research shows that learning music can aid the general learning process. This next story looks at efforts to resuscitate music education in schools and benefits to be derived from music education. Music education is a powerful tool and the Ministry of Education is prepared to pull out all the stops to ensure children can access every opportunity to get this. It is found that early music education training aids in developing brain areas involved in language and reasoning. Music helps the child with their cognitive development and their hand-eye coordination and things that are intrinsic that we don't think about because we only look, well, quite often we look at the extrinsic curriculum and we don't look at the intrinsic curriculum. But music can affect behavior, it can affect perception, it can uh, affect discipline, et cetera, et cetera. To drive a music education program, the education ministry must first resuscitate music in schools. This starts with training a core of teachers so the schools can maintain a strong music program on their curriculum. In this effort, the ministry is now training over 150 teachers. The primary school teachers, drawn from Region 3 and 4 and Georgetown, are presently engaged in a three weeks music workshop at the Theatre Gill. to do it takes all the forms within the classroom setting um, it, you can use music in this different subject area and for example I at my school I teach special children those who are intellectually impaired so I would use music to interact with my children to do maths or science or even social studies studies have shown that when children do music it helps them to increase in other areas because they will have a positive outlook on life. And right now we know that in Guyana, our children are, are doing well, but they are not reaching their full potential. And music will help them in that area because they will increase in literacy and numeracy by 20, 22%, studies have shown. And I can't wait to get back to school to bring the music to the children because I know it would lift their spirits and help them to do much better. And that's what we want. We want children to learn more and to be happy. From nursery, these children has been, I mean, involved in music. And, um, you know, coming into the primary school now, from the time they enter grade one, it's kind of exam oriented, where they have to be preparing for the grade two exam. And then they go to grade three is another exam they're preparing for. So, like, I mean, with music now involved in it, it would make the learning process much more easier. I mean, it would convey a lot instead of like you just ramming it in, into them. You will be giving it to them in a nice manner where they would enjoy what they're doing. The workshop is being facilitated by a music professor from the University of Southern Caribbean in Trinidad and Tobago. After Dr. Rupna Ryan, made it public that he intended to put music and PE back in schools, immediately my interest was piqued because my discipline is music. I lecture at the University of the Southern Caribbean in Trinidad and um, my, my area is music, like I said earlier. So when he said that, immediately I became interested in helping because I know that um, for the last 10 to 15 years, 
uh, music in the public school system had become defunct because the coordinator of music died in 2005 and she was never replaced. And even before that, she was home on leave because there was a fire at 68 Brick Dam that put her out of a space. And when uh, the Ministry of Education had found space on Camp Street, there was just no space given for the music officer. So she basically was at home for about four to five years. So it's really 15 years. And in that time, I mean, with the mass migration, lack of anybody there to coordinate or train, um, music virtually disappeared. I mean, it exists on the curriculum on paper, but nothing is being done. And um, I know the value and place of music in education. And so I decided that this would be something good for me to do. As music education is reintroduced into the schools, the Ministry of Education is aware of the need for specialist teachers who can bring solutions to the difficulties that primary school teachers face in teaching this subject. In the past, each school used to send a music teacher to these workshops with Miss Peters. And that person would go back to their school and be saddled with regular classroom duties and a regular teaching schedule, which was maths, English, social studies, and science, and they, had, they were assigned a class. So only that class really benefited from the training that person got, because that's the class they reached. And the only other students that, they, that got their skill and training were the ones who would have sung in the school choir, which, as far as I'm concerned, was not sufficient, because all the children did was sing, and no attention was given to developing music literacy and all that kind of thing. So that the child would have left primary school and only one class would have learned how to play a musical instrument, perhaps the recorder, which is a little wind instrument. And I told the minister, when we train these teachers, I would suggest that the person becomes the designated music teacher for the school and not have to teach, be assigned to a class so that they could reach the whole school. They'll become a specialist. The person will become a specialist teacher who will teach every level of the school, every class, so that they... Um, the benefit is more widespread. Within this first month of training, the teachers will cover grade one music theory. It has to be continuous. One summer workshop wouldn't teach the teachers all that they need to carry this forward. So the month is only to kick start it. And I have the blessing of my dean and my faculty at the university, who has said that the university would release me uh, two weekends per month, I would probably come in on a Thursday night and work with these same teachers to further what they're doing on a Friday and Saturday all day. So twice a month that will happen. So they'll have four days a month, six hours or five hours of instruction, lunch included. Uh, in that six, that's why I said six hours. And so wh wh what they do would be carried forward and further developed in the months ahead so that what they have learned this summer will serve them in the first term. And what we do uh, consistently in the months ahead, they'll be able to get more information to teach in the terms succeeding, so that there's a continuous development. I really believe that our children don't have the kind of diet that they need. I would like to see music and sports back in the schools, and I'm going to work very hard to ensure that this happens. Obviously, we, can't, we don't have the money to do everything I would like to do, which is to put a full orchestra in every school, but I'm consoled by the fact that every child is born with a musical instrument so that we really need to develop school choirs, bring, you know, bring that back in and give children an appreciation of all the things that music does for the soul, you know, and that's, that's what I'm interested in. There are many good reasons to teach music. There's a casual link between music and spatial intelligence, that is, the ability to perceive the world accurately and to form mental pictures of things. Music provides children with an internal glimpse of other cultures and teaches them to be considerate towards the people of these cultures. Music performances teaches young people to conquer their fears and to take risks. Music study enhances 
teamwork, skills, and discipline. Music provides children with the means to express themselves. And music teaches body awareness and high hand coordination through clapping, stomping, and playing an instrument. This is a very, very good initiative because it's going to help our children, especially the slow ones, to be able to communicate in other ways because they may not be able to get the work done with pencil and be able to understand a lot of things, but they may be to do that through music. So I think it's a very good initiative and I think that we will be going to go places with it. Music is something that I've always wanted to do. And even though I teach, not necessarily teach, but we do singing on Fridays, we would sing national songs and other songs. But you would find that pupils have this way of when you are directing them, they sing well, but when you leave them on their own, they go right back to flat singing, I would say. So this workshop here where we're learning to read the notes, the musical notes and the rhythm and so on, this would be very beneficial because I would be able to teach my pupils that so that they would, if they have, um, when they have to sing, they would go according to the notes and tones that they would use it so that we won't have the normal flat singing that they would have. And I also think that music for me is um, one of the most integral parts of life. It's like music is life. So if children don't have music, it's probably they're not living. So I've always wanted music to be back in the schools and this is a very great opportunity for that to be done. So I'm very thankful for that. The Ministry of Education believes that by reintroducing music education into our school system, the educational experience of children will be enhanced and it will assist their academic, social and emotional growth. Did you do music in school? Guyana has carved a place for itself on the international stage through various legal luminaries such as Mohamed Shabuddin, Sir Fenton Ramsahoy, Sir Lionel Laku and other notable Guyanese. Now the stage is being set for other Guyanese who may be seeking supporting careers in the legal fraternity, as three new law programs have been added to the University of Guyana's law department. Legislative drafts person are a legendary shortage of, le of legislative drafts person all over the world, not just in the Caribbean. I call them a rare breed, a special kind of person. The Ewing Law School accepts a maximum of 25 Guyanese students into its law program each year. This presents a challenge for some Guyanese students who would have completed their degree in law at the University of Guyana and need to pursue their legal education certificate. This certificate is what would allow them to be admitted to the bar locally or regionally. What then are those students to do? Those for whom no place could be found at the Ewing Law School. The introduction of the Masters of Law in Legislative Drafting graduate diploma in legislative drafting and opinion of le and the diploma in legal education are not radical developments to the law program at the Department of Law, but are necessary to meet the changing demand for legal education in Guyana and throughout the Caribbean. Offering these programs means that LLB graduates who are not afforded the opportunity to obtain their legal education certificate can now pursue specialized studies in legislative drafting which upon completion could see them embarking on very prestigious and lucrative careers in areas of law. This provides a very good alternative because uh, we do have a, a low numbers of legislative drafters in Guyana and we have a whole lot of persons with LLBs who are not as gainfully employed or as meaningfully employed as they would like to be. So having the postgraduate diploma or the masters or probably both will put them in a, a position where they can uh, employ the legal studies that I would have accumulated for the three years of the LLB and put that to use in a more meaningful manner. So uh, I know definitely there are many students who are very excited about it. They can finally advance their legal education in some way because for many persons they view the LEC as well at least the, the, the next step because in order to practice you have to get an LEC and what's that. But the thing is, I think more and more persons need to realize that uh, practicing being in the court of law is not the epitome of, of, the, of the legal profession. There's so many other areas you can get into. As a matter of fact, with the LLB itself, you can get into so many other areas. You can get into journalism, you can get into um, business, you can get into uh, foreign affairs, all of these areas. And in almost every area you get into, there is an aspect that deals with legislation. And a, a postgraduate or a master's level qualification uh, 
in legislative drafting does not just help you to draft legislation, but it helps you to understand legislation and so you're better able to interpret legislation and so you can give better legal advice. We need the skilled draftsman and woman to draft legislation that harmonizes with other Caribbean laws because of our aim of Caribbean integration. And in some instances with international standards because we are signatories to international covenants and conventions. The Caribbean Financial Action Task Force, CFATF, is a case in point. Legislation has been and is almost the only means available to states through which the conduct of the majority of society can be regulated. Legislation is pivotal in the development of the national economy as a whole and provides for more efficient business transactions. The whole idea of launching this program, besides benefiting Guyana generally, would benefit law students, especially those who can't go on, those in the 20, outside the 25 who can't go on to uh, U Wooding. All right, for two reasons. One, it gives them an advanced qualification, and two, it qualifies them in another area other than just law and law practice. Because legislative drafting, besides the demand and the need, it's a totally new field for them. And it, in fact, many people only function in, uh, as legislative drafters around the world, no, nothing else. As a result, now if you have students going on, one, you relieve the economic and the, 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 the financial pressure and the social pressure in the government because they wouldn't complain. They go on and do an LLM. Two, when they graduate with the LLM in legislative drafting, they now can choose to be drafters rather than legal practitioners. And so that's the big option they have. Skilled draftsmen are in high demand not only in Guyana, but regionally and internationally. Therefore, such a program will attract students not only from Guyana, but also the world over. So the LLM program is specially designed to train participants in the skill techniques method of interpreting and drafting legislation and regulations, primary and secondary legislation, through seminars, lectures, and workshops. It ten tends to draw from existing resources and leading practitioners in the field in legislative drafting available in the Caribbean, but even more so right here in Ghana. Given that um, Guyana is not, not, is unlike Suriname, a common law jurisdiction, as opposed to a civil law jurisdiction, in the civil law jurisdiction, valid, validly entered into treaties are automatically incorporated into the municipal sphere. Uh, there may or may not be need for regulations, but they become the law of the land. That's how the civil law system works. In the common law system, treaties have to be specifically transformed into municipal law. And anyone here who <laughs> intends to do um, public international law with Professor Pollard or Caribbean integration law with me, me you make sure you get that distinction. Civil law system, it is incorporation of international obligations. Common law, it is transformation. The long and short is therefore that legislation has to be crafted for the parliament to assent to, to give effect to the obligations in um, those treaties. So obviously, treaty drafting is um, very, very important. Additionally, paralegals and members of the discipline services can take advantage of the Diploma in Legal Education, which runs for one year. It is hoped that this will see them providing better services in their field. It's being said that friends don't let friends drive drunk, yet this continues to occur, sometimes with devastating loss of life and property. We take a look at some of the efforts being made to overcome this challenge and save lives. The issue of drunk driving remains a challenge in Guyana. 
The toll in lives and financial losses have prompted the Ghana Police Force to take increasingly stringent measures to curb what has been described as a growing menace. It was in this light that the Evidence and Motor Vehicles and Road Traffic Amendment Bill 2008, which aims to curb driving under the influence of alcohol and makes provision for fertilizers, tests, was passed. What we found in those days is that the cases went up, they had a spike, and then the cases went down. Initially hamstrung by the lack of breathalyzers, the acquisition of more units has resulted in more persons being apprehended. An additional 30 units were given to the Ghana Police Force in January of this year, and these have been distributed for use in all of the districts across Ghana. Now more stations are equipped with the breathalyzers, and they can actually do a lot of work in terms of testing. Um, we have found that persons driving under the influence is a major concern. There's lots of persons. Um, it's a factor, a contributing factor to road accidents. Therefore, especially when it comes to Friday, Saturday, and Sunday, um, that we target uh, DUI. So you'd find more persons being tested, especially, let's say, after 6 p.m., 6 p.m. and 6 a.m. in the morning and the evenings, we have a lot of force and more testing is being done along the roadways or even at roadblocks. The law makes it an offense for any person who drives or attempts to drive or be in charge of a motor vehicle if he or she has consumed alcohol in such quantity that the proportion is in his breath or blood level exceeds the prescribed limit. This prescribed limit, according to the bill, means 35 micrograms of alcohol in 100 milliliters of breath and alcohol blood concentration of 80 milligrams of alcohol in 100 milliliters of blood. During the December, November, December, what happened that the commissioner looked at what was going on as the accidents were spiraling out of control. And he put together... A, a response team where they went into every division. They brought two persons, two traffic ranks from each division at a, on a given day based on the, our stats and the ranks would go into a particular division and they will conduct campaigns targeting um, the major offenses, speeding, um, DUIs and that sort of thing. And what we did we, start, we started to, once the persons appeared in court and um, they were convicted, we published those photographs. Um, what we did was the photographs were being taken at the time they were arrested. So you would have seen them in their drunken state and what they looked like. Um, and that started to work up until I, um, we're still doing it, but there are some difficulties with photographs and taking of the photographs. But we find that when we did that, again, we had a, a, a decrease in the amount of persons. For instance, in Esequibo, they were out there, and when we, they weren't making cases, and we were on them to find out why they weren't making cases, we found out that persons weren't drinking and driving. We had a great reduction. The traffic chief explained that whilst there have been gains, there are also some challenges. For the first offense, you know that it is 7,500. Second offense, what happens is that your license are endorsed and there is a period of suspension. Um, because of the system, now we have the new license. The magistrates can, they, they can't write in the new license as a plastic license. They can write in the old ones. So we are now developing a new system whereby we can have those um, convictions recorded and we'll set up a database of traffic headquarters so that the persons with the second conviction, we can have the license in DARS um, so it can, be, yeah, it can be suspended for the period of time. The public's role in the effort against drunk driving was emphasized. I'm saying that even persons who would go into a vehicle with a driver who has just been drinking or imbibing with them, should be held responsible for that driver's conduct. So that even relatives and friends will understand that 
you know. If we scalp on the driver is under the influence and above the legal limit, that they too can be punished for being or encouraging or being in that vehicle with the wrong driver. Again, we're asking members of the public, once you observe persons drinking and biting and the attempt to go, because we don't know what would happen. It could be our relative or you know, some close person or friend who that driver can go and kill. So we'll advise you, call us. Um, the traffic headquarters number you have, you can call on 227-2349, or you can call um, Brigdam Police Station. And I know they say sometimes the 911 number don't work, but sometimes they work. You can call them or, you know, call any police station and report it. Give us the number so that we can go after them. The National Road Safety Council is doing its part in raising awareness about the dangers of drunk driving. One of the things we do, lecture to school along with the police, whatever we do is along with the police. And what we do, we usually talk to the children about their parents drinking and driving. Because, you know, we understand that children is the best teachers. Because I personally have children and I remember a lot of things that they taught me. So we use the same method back at the schools, telling them about drinking and driving, telling them about um, asking daddy if you're gonna go to a wedding or you're gonna be party and just leave the keys home and take a taxi. The recent move by the Public Security Minister, Kemrat Ramchitan, to reintroduce and enforce the law stipulating the cutoff sales time for alcohol at clubs and bars was welcomed. Persons in the road safety arena understand what is it to be drunk because anybody up at 2 a.m. in the morning is two things, drunkenness and tiredness. And if you combine the two together, you will have road accidents. And we encourage persons to let us at least try the 2 a.m. curfew. Let us see if it can work. We talk about change. Let us try a change and see how it will work. Let us see if there's a reduction. Let us give it a year. Let us give it, let, we, let us say that now it's about four months in a year or six months, um, three months or so in a year leave. Let us give it a year. And if we don't see reduction in accidents, and as the minister is trying to use it for reduction in crime, if we don't see reduction in our statistics, then we can say, let us go out there and say, we don't want a 2 a.m. curfew. But let us try it and see. Because in the road safety arena, we understand tiredness also kicks in. The, the alcohol limit is two beers, we say, two beers is the limit, which is equivalent to 0 0.8 micrograms. And if that is the case, two beers and you're very tired, you more than get high. So at the Road Safety Council, we support that call and we would like to see it happen and we'd like to see drivers designate your driver. Be responsible for yourself. Families, we know sometimes families cannot talk to a person that want to go drink and drive. But friends can talk to friends. Friends don't let friends drink and drive. For 2014, there were 135 recorded accidents with 146 fatalities. Of this amount, it is estimated that at least 13% were caused by drunk driving. As we approach Emancipation Day in Guyana, it is vital to look at the struggles our ancestors faced and which has today resulted in the quality of life that we enjoy. The historic occasion of emancipation in Guyana took place 181 years ago on August 1. It was a day that officially brought an end to the most inhumane system ever created by man for the treatment and penetration on his fellow man. Because of the narrow and unsupported view of the color of skin determined such a brutalization of his person. It was an experience that has been well chronicled with numerous revolts and unspeakable accounts of a system that removed all forms of personal control from the millions of helpless and hopeless humans, whose status as commodities rendered them as chapel property, whether on American plantations or those in the West Indies. In this subhuman state, they became dehumanized in every form and they were subjected to the most unimaginable cruelties and horrors. 
the dozens of revolts that in time characterize the natural spirit of man to become free from such forms of physical oppression and the atrocious institution called slavery eventually led to emancipation in 1838. Today, Guyana's struggles is reflected in numerous monuments and landmarks in various parts of the country. The African Liberation Monument is perhaps one of the most accessible sites, and the structure which was erected in the memory of those who struggled for freedom from human bondage can be found in the former Humanayana Kampong in Kingston, Georgetown. The monument, which was designed by architect George Henry, comprises five polished bullhead green heart poles encased in a jasper stand on a granite boulder. The varying heights of the poles signify the varying age groups of the martyrs. Meanwhile, the slab of granite represents the strength of the freedom movement and the pebbles at the base symbolizes the millions of people involved in the fight against human bondage. The Damon Monument along with the Damon's Cross also holds great significance in the struggle against slavery. The monument was erected in honor of an African domestic laborer named Damon for his struggle against the system of slavery. Built in 1988, the monument, which is located in Anna Regina, Esequibo, depicts Damon sitting in a huge chair. It is sculpted with bronze, weighs three tons, stands nine feet tall, and rests on a concrete plinth. Meanwhile, the Damon's cross marks the spot Damon and other Africans had occupied during the protests. It is also the spot where Damon raised a flag against the injustices of the system of apprenticeship that denied them their freedom. This cross can be found in the Anglican graveyard of Trinity Paris, La Belle Alliance, Esequibo Coast. Fun facts that you should know. Slavery was demolished in 1838. Guyana will be celebrating 181 years of emancipation on August 1, 2015. Slaves endure very inhumane treatment, including hanging by their ribs when their masters felt that they were disobedient, and monuments such as the Damon's Cross, Damon and the African Liberation Monuments are among those with great significance to the struggle against slavery. In next week's episode of Guyana 411, I will continue to highlight the struggles leading up to Guyana's emancipation, as well as some of the other significant landmarks associated with Emancipation Day.